you up a bit. I don't know which way. Oh, here we go. There we go. There we go. Stop. <laughs> two cousins. <laughs> Lana Dean and, 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 and Patricia. Patricia is always uh, there together. <laughs> I guess you all know Ollie, right? <laughs> so, and so, and so, oh my God, what is all of this? Um, is that a gun you're holding or what is it? Can we just take one of those away or something? Or Anyway, they can't see me. <laughs> I'm Mary Wilson, one of these Supremes, and I'm going to try to talk without this microphone because I think it's, it's, can you hear me there? Oh good, that's perfect. It's so wonderful to be here with everyone. You know, I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm one of the girls who sang background behind Dinah Ross, you know, I did all the oohs and ahs, the baby, baby, babies with Florence Ballard. And, uh, yeah, and so, I see a lot of smiles when I say that, but you, don't be laughing because I was laughing all the way to the bank before you started. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's really just wonderful. I, I, I often wonder why, uh, or if what I'm speaking about is going to be interesting to everyone because, you know, it's, for me, my life has been just exciting. It's been just very, very, very wonderful. I wish I could just move that. Can we, or just, or turn it around, because I can't see folks. Yeah, I don't need all that. <laughs> yeah? I got all this. Okay, I got all this. I'll pop the I got a clean house here. Yeah. There we go. We'll do it like that. Okay, there we go. That's much better. Now, so um, anyway, I just, you know, I wonder if my life is going to be interesting to everyone else because for me, it's been great. Hi, girl. <laughs> Now she's not my cousin, so <laughs> it's all right. Okay, so you know, anyway, I, I've had this great life. Whenever people ask me to, to, to speak, it's one of those things where I often wonder uh, if, if everyone else is having a great life mine is. Mine is really great. It hasn't always been great, but I always thought that's the most, most important thing, I guess, what I'm trying to bring out. It's always been fun and exciting, and I remember as a child, I used to sit by my um, glass plate window and just stare out into into uh, the, the sky. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I was always kind of aware how beautiful the world was. I mean, the sky, the clouds, and, and, and all the things. Oh, I'm like, oh, they are going. Good, good, good. Mm -hmm. I want to stop right there. With that. Okay. And so, you know, I, I the thing about my life is that I, I have always felt beautiful, even though it didn't start out beautiful with me. I was given to an aunt and uncle when I was five years old, and I don't really remember anything before I was five. I don't know about you guys if you remember anything before you were five years old, <laughs> but I didn't. And so the first thing I recall was that uh, my aunt and uncle were my mom and my dad. And so that's, I grew up just thinking that they were my mom and my dad, and that was just beautiful. And my aunt um, actually was the person that showed me about style and all those kind of things. At the age of 11, I found out that they were not, my aunt and uncle were not my mom and my dad. And I was like devastated. I was really devastated because, um, you know, my whole world just kind of crashed. And uh, I was very fortunate, though, when my mother came into my life, uh, I, I, I loved her. I mean, she was like an angel. She was like, all of a sudden, this angel came into my life. So I had already had this one set of, um, of uh, images in my life about beauty and things. And then all of a sudden, I had to readapt to this new life of, of a woman who was poor. She couldn't read or write, my mom. And uh, also, um, my aunt and uncle were fairly well off. They had their own house, and, and my aunt dressed me in beautiful clothes, and, and she introduced me to style and all that stuff. And I was a little black princess in, in the 40s, you know? <laughs> and uh, then here comes my mom, and she moved, moved me out of this neighborhood into the projects, the Brewster Projects in Detroit, Michigan. And it was there that I saw another kind of beauty. Everybody was poor, but everybody was happy. Uh, you know, it was like hundreds and thousands of people who lived in the projects. 
And so, um, and then music was coming about. This was like 1956, when rock and roll was coming in. So all of a sudden, I had this, I was like, one of these little kids was like, one foot here, one foot there, and I'm like, okay. But beauty was all around me, and poverty was too. So I, I remember it was a time when um, people, everybody was starting to sing and all those kind of things, and this is when I ran into Florence and Diane. Uh, I was in, in the elementary school, and they had a contest in school where uh, we were, uh, anyone who wanted to be a part of the show would sign up. So I signed up. I don't know why I signed up. I had just seen Frankie Lyman and the Teenage. You know, why do we sing so gay and love us? And so I had just seen them on television, right? And uh, I uh, signed up to all this program. I didn't know anything about singing. All I knew about singing was every morning I'd wake up singing. I didn't know it was talent. It was just the way I woke up. I woke up singing. And so uh, I signed up. And I was on the program. Uh, and I remember my brother used to wear, you know, process hair. <laughs> and so, you know, the guys would have these do rags tied around their heads. And the do rags was like, you know, like Jerry Curl in, in the days today where they, they put the rag around here so that the grease wouldn't drop. <laughs> so, in the 50s, you know, this is what they did. And so I borrowed my brother's do rag, which was a real dirty, but I had to do it anyway. And so, and then he had one of these cones, like these picks that they used to do like this, the boys did like this, so I put it in my back pocket because I borrowed my brother's blue jeans and his black leather jacket. Uh, and uh, so what, what happened was I got on stage and they played the record of I'm Not a Juvenile Delinquent by the Teenagers, and I pantomimed to it. Now, I just want to explain how this back in the 50s was not in I don't know how I came up with the idea to pantomime to this this record and to perform because I had never ever performed in my life anywhere. I just did it for myself, just saying to myself. So I got up there and I was like, pantomime, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to town. And then the audience started saying, go, Mary, go, because it was in the gymnasium at the you know at school in the seventh or eighth grade. Go, Mary, go, Mary, go, Mary. And I was saying to myself. Wow, this is cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had never done it. I, I don't, so sometimes I think in life, uh, what life is, it, it, it kind of leads you, and if you listen to it, it, it can direct you, right? And if you're given a gift, that gift can come out, unless sometimes it can be overshadowed. Now, what I usually talk about is daring to dream, because I think at that moment, I dared to dream. I didn't know what I was dreaming of, but maybe those days when I was looking out at the sky, I was dreaming without thinking. I don't know, maybe I was thinking, I don't know. Anyway, so the point is, I decided at that moment, it was really good. That felt like heaven. It felt real. It felt like I didn't have to think about doing it. It just started to happen, right? And so then Florence Ballard was on the same show. Now, as I said, in the project, there were hundreds and thousands of people who lived there in this vast area of poverty. And uh, Florence Ballard came up and she sang. I had seen her in the projects. I didn't really know her. And, uh, and she said, uh, she sang, And she came when she did that, and everyone was like, wow. So she and I migrated together. I, the truth is, I don't remember anyone else on that show but Flo and me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we migrated towards each other, and we started talking. And we started talking about, she said, girl, you had everybody in that gym name going, go, Mary, go, Mary. And I said, wow, but you're a boy. Your voice is so big and so beautiful, and, and everybody was like this. Because no one had ever, ever in the projects, nobody had ever heard anything like that. It was like listening to an opera singer, you know, her voice was just, it was big, it was beautiful. So anyway, she and I spoke uh, that whole afternoon, and we walked home together. I remember we held hands, and I remember feeling like, wow, I got a friend. I got a friend. 
And so then the next couple of weeks, we, we hung out together and, and, and just to talk about life at 12 and a half years old as much as you can talk about life. <laughs> and uh, it was so beautiful because everyone was forming these groups in the projects. And we would stand in the hallways and you would hear these guys that do walk runs, you know, and they would be singing and all those kind of things. So uh, we said, wow, people are putting together groups. Maybe we should think about putting together a group. Now, here's what I talk about daring to dream. We start to dare to dream at that moment at 12 years old, mm -hmm. when she was 12 and a half, I was only 12. Flow <laughs> <laughs> six months older than Diana. So anyway, her sister was with a group of guys who uh, were called the Primes, and they were looking for a group of girls uh, to kind of be on their show with them when they did these weekend gigs. And uh, what, we, what we did was, um, her sister said, my sister can really sing. Flo can really sing. And uh, so they asked Flo to join. And then uh, Flo called and she said, Mary, this group of guys called the Primes, honey. They, you know, they're, 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 um, they're putting together this group and I told them about you. And then somebody asked about this girl who lived across the street. You know that skinny girl, Diane? And this person, she can really sing. So they said they want us to come over to their apartments. <laughs> They want us over there at 4 a.m. and uh, 4 4 p.m. And, and, and they have to have, right? so, so then, so then she, they, she said, there's another girl named Betty, and she's dating one of the guys. But well, anyway, they all be there, and they want to meet us. So we go into the apartment. We met up with Diane. This is the first time I really talked to Diane at, at any length. We walk over to their apartment. It was by the Flame Show Bar. I don't know if anyone's from Detroit, but it's a very famous. Uh, club that all the big stars will perform at. Uh, uh, everybody performed at it. Nat King Cole, the whole crew. So anyway, their apartment was right across from the playing so far. We go into the apartment, and these three fine boys, I'll show them to you later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're there, right? And so they said, well, do you girls know any songs? And what well, we had never sang together. We didn't know anything. So, but Florence started singing, you know the night time? You know, great job, one of these kids, right? right? And so the three of uh, me, uh, Diane and, and Betty, started chiming in, night and day, night, you know, we were just jamming, and we got, we were singing, and we looked at, we looked at each other, and we were like, wow, we sounded good. I mean, it, was like, it, was, it, was, it was one of those, I believe in miracles, it was one of those, miracles that you didn't plan. You didn't plan this. It just kind of happened. And, and all whatever God gave you just kind of was there and you grabbed it. That's what I'm talking about, daring to dream, dream right? And so um, they said, okay, you girls are going to be called the Prime Maps. We're the Primes, you're the Prime Maps. And when we do our weekend gigs, you'll come on, you do a couple songs, then we'll come out and we'll do our bit. So it was the Primes and the Prime Maps. <laughs> Uh, and so this was when I realized in life that dreams do come true. I mean, dreams, does anybody have a tissue? My nose is running. <laughs> <laughs> dreams do, dreams do come true. I mean, I remember when I was a baby and I was, uh, my mother said to me, she says, Mary, when you were born and the doctor spanked you, you started singing. I'm like, Really? I had three children, I don't ever remember. <laughs> Mine was cesareans, let me tell you. Uh, but anyway, she said that about me, and I, it, it, it dawned on me because I always, oh, thank you so very much. <laughs> oh, girl, I'll take you <laughs> Uh, as, as I was saying, what was I saying? Where, where did I leave off? Anyway, the thing about it is, 
what did I leave off? You remember what I said? Spain, my mom is Spain. Anyway, because here I was, I, I would wake up every morning, so obviously it was something that I always did, but I never thought about it. I never thought, you know, I don't know about you guys who are out there. You have something going on, it always kind of reoccurs, come up in your life, and you don't know where it comes from, but it's there, but you don't look at, it, look at it, you don't listen to it, you don't abide by it. Well, I'm so happy that somehow or another, I never left the road of singing, and it was always there, even though I didn't know it was something special. And I just thought this is what I did. So when I say dare to dream, and dreams do come true. It's one of those things where we do have to follow what's inside. I know a lot of famous people, a lot of rich people, who are not happy. Because why? Maybe they're reaching for the money, they're reaching for the position, they're reaching, reaching for power, reaching for all these things, but the, what they really, what would really make them happy, they kind of like don't cultivate it or try to discover it or realize what it is. And I, I, I learned that uh, thoughts have powerful, they have powerful, things can happen to you if you think the right things about your life. And so for me, I started realizing, I started thinking, well, you know, this singing thing is really something that I enjoy doing. And I realized at that moment with, with Flo Giant and Betty that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And that's when I made up my mind that I would definitely follow that. And I'm so happy that I was able to do that. So now, what do we do? Those weeks of, uh, those years of practicing, what they say, um, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. That's what we did every weekend. Honey, we would go out and we would work here, we would work there, we'd do all those wonderful, wonderful things. So as a teenager, that's kind of what I, I did. And I remember when we first decided that, well, maybe we should do something a little different. We were on a show with, the, it was Johnny Mathis, he had come into town. And we did all the, the DJ shows. How many people remember DJs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> They're not going out of style nowadays. But we would do all those shows, and the DJs would say, and that, next week we're going we're gonna to have the Primates on the show with Johnny <laughs> Mathis and Mel Carter. So we would do all those weekend shows for the DJs. And it was amazing because we started realizing, well, these people are making records and we're just on the show. Maybe we should make one bigger for records. <laughs> so that's what we did. We uh, decided to go to Motown and audition. We met up with Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. And uh, we met up with uh, uh, Mary Wells. And so we went to Motown and we auditioned. But when we auditioned, Mr. Barry Gordy, turned us down. And we were like, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, we're good. Why did he turn us down? Well, we were only about 14 or 15 years old. And so he said, come back and see me after you graduate from high school. We were like, well, our parents are not going to let us get out of high school. Honey. We're going to be in high school anyway. You know? <laughs> but we didn't realize at the time that probably he did not want to see, uh, you know, four teenage girls in his company. You know, we didn't realize that. We were just thinking about we're good and this is what we want to do. So anyway, we decided to go to Motown every single day. Every single day we went there and we would sit outside of Motown. I guess wait. How many wells? Smoke it, smoke it! You know, we just, oh, we were just all over the place. Right? And, and so then one day, oh, this is, oh, I just want to say, this is, this is, that's me in the middle. Close at the top and uh, that's Florence, and this was Barbara, who actually replaced Betty, because P Betty was a little older than us, and she got married, so she left the group, and we got Barbara in the group. So that was the climax, right? And here's Flo, who, my very dear friend, I absolutely miss so very much. So uh, we went to Motown again, and we sat there every day, and one day, someone came out, a producer came out and said, the background singers are not here. We said, wait, wait, <laughs> We were in. They used us, and we started recording. We did something like about, oh, I don't know, seven recordings during that time. And Mr. Barry Boy said, you know, you girls are really, 
you're really serious, I'm going to put you with my pop writing team. We write. <coughs> so anyway, he put us with, oh, here's, now I should say, first of all, the Miracles and, and were a group that was very popular at the time. And Diane just happened to have known Smokey from a previous neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And he really was one of the guys who got us the audition with Barry Boy. So we're forever indebted to, to him and the Miracles. So anyway, we, uh, oh, I gotta show you. Here are the guys in the primes. Now this was a different, uh-oh, oh, oh I shouldn't have done that. Oh, oh here we go. Uh, and the guy at the top is Eddie Kendricks, and this is Paul Williams. They were the primes. So, and then they went on to become the Temptations. So that was something that, and we've been brother and sister group, you know, all these years. So it's really, again, I say that miracles do happen, and I truly believe in miracles uh, because my life has always, always, well, not always been that way. There's some things that shouldn't be that way. But anyway, there's no real right. There's more than a lot of things, but we won't do that. So, um, so Mr. Barry Goy put us together with Holland, those in Holland, the writing team who gave us 12, well, they gave us 10 million selling number one recordings. And we had five consecutive number one records, uh, which at, in the 60s, uh, that was from 1964 to 1960, in the 65, we had the five consecutive number ones. And that was when, of course, the Beatles and the British, all that stuff was coming over here. So we girls were giving them a run for their money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Of, there were a lot of great people out there recording during that time. But we have to remember that this was a time when dreams for Afro-American Negroes, colored people, as we were called back in the day, were not really something that happened. You know, you didn't dream about being great in those days. You just dreamt about making a living, really. And coming from where I came from, I can tell you, we did a lot of shows that were segregated shows where uh, just before we had our hit record, we, we did a show with um, Dick Clark, his Caravan of Stars. And we traveled, we traveled all over America and had to play, play. you think we would have the white on this side, the black on this side, or I remember certain places, the, the colored people would be on top and the white would be on the bottom. That was just the way it was. And so to, to dare to dream, at that time, for us, was an impossible dream. I mean, when I say impossible, it was impossible. I remember drinking out of water fountains for color only, and then the white only was over there as well. So those were the times that we came through all this to come to here doing command performances, and this is the Queen Mother, the mother of the Queen in England, to come to that point and still be living in the Brewster Projects, which let me tell you, was really something. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and one of the ladies, th that was the Queen Mother, this lady here is Princess Margaret. Now she uh, is the sister of the Queen, and if you guys know the history of some of what's going on, what was going on over there, Princess Margaret was a character. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, we Supreme always had the big hair and the long lashes, and well, still do, but. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we did this. We did this command performance, and it was the Queen Mother. It was Princess Anne. It was Prince Charles, and it was just the whole the whole family was there. It was a great, great performance. Uh, Abel Burke Humperdinck was on the show, and it was about two o'clock. I think Diane Carroll, a lot of people from America were on the show. And I remember after the Queen Mother walked past, uh, Princess Margaret came by and she says, <laughs> Is that a real <laughs> 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 Well, <laughs> as I said, as I said, you know, we were in living in the Rooster Projects and had, you know, come from that. And it, it, that, it was a moment for me where I grew, I learned a lot about life. Uh, and, and the one thing is that people are just people. No matter what stage of life they come from, 
you know, no matter how old or no matter how what what religion or whatever, in here we all kind of like the same, you know. And she reminded me of Miss Louise, who lived down the hall from us in the group of five. And so what I realized was, I'm okay, you know. I'm, I'm people have desires and thoughts and things that they do, and they're no different if they got money. If they don't have money, they're still people deep down inside. So that was a really growing moment for me. It was a moment where I learned so much about not just life, but people. And you know, people like Marvin Gaye or, uh, or, or Milton Monroe, a lot of people who, who had so much success, so much, all these wonderful things, all the miracles that happen in life, but yet still they're not happy. And, and so I said, I said to myself, you know, wow, you know, I'm really, really proud of what I've, what I've done, what I've accomplished, and inside, I am a happy human being. So many of us are not happy. We have things happen to us. I mean, I can tell you, I'm not going to go into today, but divorces, you know, in a, in a marriage that's abusive, or in a workplace where you don't really like working there, but I understand all you guys would enjoy working here. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's what I'm told. <laughs> Wonderful. And coming president, you got to keep that going on. Okay? Yes. <laughs> so, you know, but the thing about it is that so often in life, our circumstances get in the way. And, and we can't overcome some of the circumstances. When I look at over my life and I realize I, too, could have been a very unhappy person. I could have been totally destroyed with my finding out what I found out about my, my aunt, my uncle, and my mom. But uh, I was able still to see the beauty in life. And it really is up to each individual to dare the dream again and again and again, no matter what happens. If this doesn't go, girl, just get up and keep on moving. Uh, I lost a son in 1994 uh, in a car accident. And unfortunately, it was the car that I was driving. And uh, it was one of those things that I again had to get up and, and, and pull upon that inner strength uh, that my aunt and my uncle and my mom had given to me. Even though they were poor, we were happy. We still were happy people. So, you know, being a supreme and traveling around, I totally appreciated these wonderful things because I, I met so many great people and learned so much. And, and as a Supreme, we did so many great things. I mean, we really were uh, a group that changed, made a lot of changes in America. Not, we weren't the only ones. There were lots of pioneers. There were people, my friend Sammy Davis, who was just one of the great people uh, that we worked with. We did so many S. Summer shows. They, 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 oh, we worked with their Sammy. Uh, Sammy was one of those wonderful human beings who just, he too had a zest for life, you know, this, he was happy, he was a happy human being, uh, but had to go through a lot of things in life, especially get a big start and never really get into full through because he was black. And this was at a time when blacks still were not super, super stars. Fortunately, today everybody thinks there's a star. How many stars do we have to have here tonight? <laughs> oh, come on, guys, come on. <laughs> so anyway, we, you know, we traveled the world, we did all these great things, and uh, we did, uh, we did some movies too. <laughs> now you, you remember the days when the only black folks were only maids and janitors. Uh, okay, Mr. But anyway, so we were able to do, you know, movies and television show. Um, and we were back. We did one of the first television specials ever with the Supreme with our brothers, the Temptations, had the first TCB, it was called. 1968, so we were one of the first to do that. We endorsed a lot of products. Uh, we did, we had a lot of different great people. We had, oh, we had a, our own line, our own bread line. <laughs> <laughs> Coca-Cola, 
Uh, and, and of course, we didn't get the kind of money that Michael Jackson and I wish all those people later on got, but we were, as we were some of the first, we got whatever they gave us, and that was a, a great line of endorsing Coca-Cola. Uh, and um, then I decided to write my book. And I wrote my, my first book was Dream Girl, and Life is a Supreme. And I should tell you, how many people saw that movie? Dream Girls, yeah? It's a great movie, right? Great, I mean, great movie. And everyone thinks that it was about the Supremes, but it was not about the Supremes, and I know because, well, I didn't get paid. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I was called by the, the play, by, me, I was called by the lawyer, and the lawyer said, oh, Miss Wilson, we understand that you're uh, calling your book Dream Girl. I said, no, my book is called Dream Girl, My Life is a Supreme. He says, well, perhaps we need to talk. I'm like, okay, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> so uh, they had their lawyer call me, and then I said, well, you know, this is, it's supposedly about the Supremes. Yes, I'm like, well, then we really do need to talk because <laughs> no one's paid me. And so he said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard from him again. <laughs> so my thing is, whenever anyone buys my book, Believe Girl, My Life is a Supreme, I get paid. I figure out a way to get paid. So thank you if you buy a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's got it. <laughs> so I mean, I actually, that's. This is the original book, yeah. I actually uh, wrote diaries when I was young. I kept a diary from the time I was, uh, uh, I think it was 70, I was 17 because I was getting ready to graduate from school. And my teacher, Mr. Boone, said, Ms. Wilson, may I speak with you? And I'm like, yes. He says, I understand. You're still singing with that little group, the Climax. He says, and uh, 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 you know, I want to talk to you because if you want to graduate my, and, and, and pass my English class, you're going to have to do better at school instead of running down to that little Motown. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, I wrote a, a chapter, I wrote a thing, uh, a thesis, and uh, he passed it back to me. He says, Miss Wilson, I'm scared to death. He says, uh, no, he didn't say that. I said that. <laughs> I'm scared to death. And so he says, uh, this paper is back. I'm like, what? He says, yes. So what I wrote about it, was my life up to that point, the years with my aunt, my uncle, and how I felt that adults were liars and cheats and this and that. So that was my <coughs> that was the paper. He says, I'm giving you an A, 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 as many A's as I can give you. So I used that as the first chapter mm -hmm. in my book when I wrote my book. And it was at that point, he's oh, he says, I think you should become a writer. I'm like, I want to get down to Motown and record and get a hit record. That's what I think I didn't say that. Yeah. And so uh, I started keeping a diary at that point. At 17, I kept a diary until I was 55 years old. Oh, by the way, I'm 71 and a half. Wow. <laughs> I made it, you know. <laughs> people are dropping like flies. <laughs> so anyway, I, I kept, I started in my diary. And I wrote my book based upon my diaries. Uh, all of my travels around the world. And uh, it, it was just really wonderful. Again, I dared to dream. I didn't know what I was doing, but I just kept that diary and one day it paid off. So anyway, uh, if you get a chance to see the movie again, go and see it again, because it's still very cool. And one of the reasons I wanted to see it, because the girl who got the uh, Academy Award, uh, Hudson, Jennifer I was telling you how wonderful a singer Florence Ballard was. Well, Jennifer did a great job, because her voice, of course, we all know it's fabulous, but Flo had that same kind of voice. And unfortunately, unfortunately, she was never, ever able to sing on our records the way she should have been. Because we found a formula with Diane singing on these, which we're happy because we had those 10 million solid records, plus we got 12, actually. And, uh, and you know, so it just worked out when Flo didn't get a chance to sing. I get the chance to sing. I'm still here. Flo died in 1976. Never got that chance. 
and a lot of people who have talent never, even if you're working in an organization like you are now, and you're on a certain level and you don't get to go to that level, I know women probably, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> women, you know, that ceiling we're talking about, a lot of times you, do, you can't because of circumstances, whatever happens within the, the, the arena that you're in, you don't get to be where you want to be or where you should be. Uh, it flows like that. And unfortunately, <laughs> Flo was uh, abused when we were still the primates at the age of 14. And I'm only saying this because I know the internet nowadays, you punch in there, you can punch in and blow in there. So she was an alcoholic, she was this, she was that. But unfortunately for her, at the age of 14, she was abused by a neighborhood person. And um, Flo was never the same after that. Even when we became famous, Diane and I thought that Flo was going to be able to overcome that because now we're rich and we're famous and we've got the world and we're doing all these great things and we're happy, but we didn't talk about those kind of things back in those days. Nowadays, everybody has a therapist. I, I, mean, I never had one. I was my own therapist. But, <laughs> but nowadays, people do and they can go in and have these things taken care of. Flo never had it taken care of, so it just ate away at her. And eventually, she was replaced in the group uh, because her behavior had become so so horrible because she couldn't deal with that, and I don't know who can. Uh, same thing with our guys who go to war. You know, uh, they come back. They, they, my brother, who was in the Vietnam War, said, "Mary, if I told you some of the things that I had to do, he said I can't." So he's never, he's never told me those things. So a lot of times, I go, again, I say, "Why we have to dare to dream." dare to dream because sometimes life throws things at you that you can't handle you know um so with flow that's kind of what happened so when if you hear that she was an alcoholic or all this stuff she was just trying to be able to pain uh so um in, in, in life we went on we were supremes without flow went on and it was very hurtful for me every night that i sing uh a show i sing one of the songs from Dream Girls, I Am Changing, because I know that if Flo were here, she would sing that song, I Am Changing. Uh, she would say, look at me, Ooh. look at me, I am changing, trying every way I can, I'm changing. I'll be better than I am. I'm trying to find a way to understand. But I, I need you. I need a hand. I am changing. Now I can sing it, but my friend Flo can't. But I sing it every night when we're on stage. Because I know that if she were here, she would see that those of us who are still alive, you know, we need to know that you do need to change. I know when I was young, I thought, honey, I was perfect. Well, I knew I was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, but I, I, now that I'm older, I know that, yes, you do need to change. You have to change. The world is changing. So you've got to change, too. You cannot sit on your laurels or sit on what you used to know, because what you used to know is not working today, uh, and we need to know that. Um, we got um, uh, awards, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, we've been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that's why my legs are really cool. <laughs> so many wonderful things in life and I'm very, very proud of it um, to say that life has been good and dreams do come true. Uh, I want to leave you with one thought about daring to dream and here's to life. I have no complaints, no regrets. I still Believe in chasing dreams and placing bets. 
But I have learned that all you give is all you get. So give it all you got. I have my share. And I drank my fill. Even though I'm satisfied, I'm hungry still. To see what's down another road. So here's to life and every joy it brings. So here's to life, to dreamers and their dreams. Funny how the time just flies. How love can go from warm hellos to sad goodbyes and leave you with the memories you memorized to keep your winters warm. Well, there's no yes and yesterday, and who knows what tomorrow brings or takes away. As long as I'm still in the game, I'm going to play the last for life, the love. So here's to life and every joy it brings. So here's to life, to dreamers and their dreams. Mm -hmm. They never really had their mom when they, after they were five. 
So I know what that feels like not to have really known her. Yes. What about Diana? What about Diana? <laughs> speak to her a lot these days but we still do talk and she is she's just a, her dream was a little bigger than mine <laughs> and she wants she got what she wanted you know she wanted to be a major star and she is a major star she's a wonderful major star and if you see her she's gorgeous um, and and so I, I went after the point of trying to be a great wonderful human being and I'm good at that so we, we got this <laughs> of the Holland Doja Holland primates uh, in the future? Wh where is that going? Well, that's kind of hard to answer. You know, I think uh, your, the group uh, uh, in Vogue, and I think a lot of those groups have kind of done that. Uh, I believe that there's always talent. Uh, to try to recreate the 60s is very difficult. People are trying to do it, but I don't think we can do it because it's a, it was a whole different set of things. I don't know how to explain it. But I still think that there's room. Every generation will bring a different thing about it. Remember rock and roll is, oh, it will never last, and oh, try that music now, it's ended about rap. Well, I still say that. But. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there's always, there's always something new coming. So music, talent, I think it's always going to be there, but it won't be like what we knew. We, we had a great time in the 60s, didn't we, folks? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's going to go down in history. I think that's a, a separate thing. Okay, let's give Mary Wilson another round.